All right. Listen, I've been looking forward to this weekend for a long, long time. This is a special weekend. I'm sure you probably already have guessed most of you what the deal is, but this is the weekend we passed the milestone of having received and given away over a million dollars for change for a dollar. We had our first Change for a Dollar offering on the first weekend of July in 2015. And so in a little less than five years, Change for a Dollar has made an incredible impact on many, many lives right here in our community and beyond. If you've been a part of our church that length of time, you know that some of our stories go well beyond the Greenwood or South Indianapolis community. And since the inception of Change for a Dollar, I have had more people than I can count. I'm talking about people who are a part of our Mount Pleasant family say something to me like, this is the best thing our church has ever done. Or of all the things that our church does to help other people, this is hands down the best. And that's saying something when you think of the multitude of different ways that Mount Pleasant Christian Church is involved in making an impact on the lives of people in our community every single day. And it's based on such a simple concept. If everyone who comes to church will be willing to give just $1 more to the offering than they were originally planning to give for themselves and everyone in their family, everyone that they brought, then at the end of the weekend, we can multiply the number of people in church by that $1 amount and make an incredible difference in people's lives. In fact, I've got just a cursory list here in my notes of some of the ways that change for a dollar has blessed people's lives. And by the way, this weekend, since inception, we will help our 250th Change for a Dollar recipient. This weekend, Kent is our 250th recipient since July 2015. We've helped four families get cars that had no transportation. We're going to do that again this weekend with Kent. And uh, this is the kind of thing that happens. Sometimes the change for dollar stories are so compelling and somebody in the audience is so moved that they step forward and they help in an extraordinary way. And we've had people uh, outside of the change for a dollar monies uh, make it possible for someone to have a car all at their own expense. I think I told you a couple years ago that one year during change for a dollar, we had somebody who loved the ministry so much that they wrote a check to us for $40,000 and they said, take this $40,000, divide it by 52 weekends and add the weekend amount, the weekly amount of that to each change for a dollar offering. And that was a tremendous blessing for many people. Uh, we've assisted uh, recipients in purchasing handicap accessible vehicles. We've helped the recipients purchase motorized wheelchairs. Uh, we've uh, helped to keep the lights and the utilities, the heat on for many families, furnished apartments. Listen, paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills over the last almost five years, kept families from being homeless. We helped a pastor uh, in a, a small church in Ohio who was losing his hearing get hearing aids. And if you've never had a problem with, with your hearing, uh, I'm telling you, it, it is a difficult, difficult thing to deal with. I know that firsthand from my own family. We've helped uh, three families fund adoptions, and I could go on and on and on, change for a dollar has been an incredible blessing for many, many people. And so what I want to do, and I'm just going to speak for a few minutes this morning, is I want, as we celebrate Change for a Dollar, to talk about it with you and what it is at the most basic level. Normally, at this point in the service, I would say, if you've got a Bible with you, take it and open it up to a certain passage. Our, our passage this morning is a very brief passage in John 13. It's John 13, verses 34 and 35. But rather than having us turn there together, because it's so brief, I'm just going to put it on the screen. And for our public reading of Scripture time, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me, and we're going to read these words together. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. I want you to read them with me. Let me hear your voices. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask God to bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let me tell you what Jesus is doing with these words. He's making sure that his disciples know that the mark, everyone say mark, mark, the mark of a Christian is love. It's love. It's that simple. It's not something that's political. It's not something that's sociological. It's not even in the strictest sense something that's theological. The mark of a, Christ, <coughs> excuse me, of a Christian is love. And that mark of love crosses denominational and 
doctrinal boundaries because it's something that every Christian should understand as the foundation of their faith regardless of what church they go to. The mark of a Christian, according to Jesus, is love. He said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this, friends, is what makes Christianity unique. I mean, what other religion is based on the founder's infinite love for his followers, a love that is so great that he was willing to give up his life for them? But it's even more than that because Jesus didn't just give up his life. He didn't just die for his followers. He died for everyone. He died for the whole world. That means Jesus died for people who up to this point in their lives have never even heard of him. He died for people who ignore him, people who dismiss him, people who reject him, and people who despise him. Jesus died for everyone. That becomes clear when you read these words from Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, written by the Apostle Paul. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for, it, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul doesn't qualify those words. Basically, he is saying Jesus died for everyone because Jesus loves everyone everyone. And so love is the foundation and the mark of the Christian faith. And Jesus tells that, us that in our text in an emphatic way. We are to love one another. And here's the really great thing about those, those words that we just read, those words that Jesus spoke in John chapter 13. They don't require any interpretation. They just require application. That's the great thing about Jesus saying, love one another. They don't require interpretation. Just application. You can't argue about what the meaning is of Jesus' statement, love one another. We can have different opinions and different interpretations about a lot of things. We can argue about communion. We can argue about baptism. We can argue about issues like eternal security or predestination. We can argue about spiritual gifts. We can argue about the music that we sing when we go to church or the way you're supposed to dress when you go to church. And you can go on and on and on. But there is absolutely no room for argument or disagreement when it comes to Jesus' words when he said, love one another. No room for argument. He tells us this is what we're supposed to do, and he does it in a plain and a simple and a straightforward way. And so let's just take a minute and talk about what that really means, what we really need to understand about that kind of love. I've got three things that I want to share with you. If you'd like to take notes, write down next to number one. We need to understand love isn't an option, it's a requirement. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, love isn't an option, it's a requirement. Jesus said in verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. I think some time ago I probably told you the story. I lose track sometimes of the stories I've told you uh, about my life because I've been here for so long. But I think I probably told you some time ago about when I was in my last semester of college, there were two required courses I had to take for graduation that I put off purposely. I purposely put off until my last semester because I wanted my last semester to be easy. And those two, those two required courses were called Old Testament Drill and New Testament Advanced Survey. That's the name of them in the syllabus. And I thought, because I had grown up in church my entire life and I learned a lot about the Bible over the years, that those were not going to be difficult classes for me, but I never bothered to ask anybody what they were all about. And so when I showed up to both of those classes on the first day of the final semester, I found out that the essence of both of those classes was the memorization of all the content of every chapter in the Bible. Yeah. And while I could tell you a lot about the Bible without having one with me, like where all the familiar stories are and all the familiar verses, you know, I could even tell you the, the chapter and sometimes even the verse. I don't know what it says, for example, in Zechariah chapter 12. I'm not even sure there is a Zechariah chapter 12. <laughs> And so I spent that last semester of college studying like a crazy man to be able to pass the finals because the finals, you went to class every day and they didn't, there was a professor there, he didn't say anything because there wasn't anything to say. You just sat there and you studied and you had to write out for the final of each class, you had to write out the content of every chapter in the Bible because without those required courses, you couldn't graduate. Well, just like you can't graduate from college without a passing grade in all the required courses, you can't live the Christian life without a commitment to loving people. You can't do it. 
Over the years, I've spent a lot of time around Christians who will oftentimes place an extraordinary amount of value on something that they think is really, really important. But oftentimes, it's just a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of doctrine. It's not a foundational to the Christian life. It's just a matter of opinion. But oftentimes, people who get bogged down in these kinds of things will be so intense with their belief about them that they make them a test of fellowship with other believers. Or in other words, if you don't believe exactly like I do in every way about this issue, I can't be your brother. We can't spend time together. We certainly can't go to church together. I remember when I was a pastor in Texas many, many years ago, and back in those days when someone would visit your church, you would follow up and visit them in their home. We don't do that anymore because nobody's <laughs> at home usually. But anyway, I went to their home one night. They ushered me into their dining room, and they had a long dining room table, and they sat me at one end of the dining room table while they sat on the other end of the dining room table. They took out an eight and a half by 11 pad, legal pad, and they had things written on every line of the pad, and they began to go through a list of questions, to, and then they would make notes about my answer, and it was all the things that were important to them, and that was the deciding factor whether they would be a part of the church that I served. I didn't even make it halfway through the list, by the way, and they never came back to my church after that, so I don't think I passed the test. Listen, here's what Jesus is telling us in really simple terms. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much you do. It doesn't even matter how much conviction you might have about a certain issue if you don't love other people because it's loving others that is the mark and the foundation of our faith. Look at these words written by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which, by the way, is the love chapter in the New Testament. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is the mark of the Christian faith. And by the way, you can't pick and choose who you love. Jesus says that we're to love everyone. And so when it comes to being a Christian and it comes to living the Christian life, loving others is more than an option. It is the basic entry level requirement for everyone who wants to be a Christian. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. Right down next to number two. Love is not an abstract idea. It's following his example. Jesus said, again, this is John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And so Jesus showed us what love looked like. You can think of it like this. Jesus didn't tell us how to live. Jesus showed us how to live. And by the way, right before Jesus gave his disciples that commandment, do you remember what he did? He washed their feet. That was the setting, that was the context for John chapter 13. So we're supposed to live in a way that models the same love that Jesus had. Well, how does Jesus love? How did Jesus love people? How does Jesus love us? We could answer that a hundred different ways. I've got three things written down here. First of all, he loves us sacrificially. Jesus laid his life down for us. And so in the same way, we need to be willing to lay our life down, not just for Jesus, but for others as well. We could say that Jesus loved us mercifully, even though Jesus is perfect, the Bible makes it clear to us that Jesus understands that we're not perfect. And so what does Jesus do when we fail? What does Jesus do when we stumble and we mess up? He forgives us and gives us another chance. And so that means to love others in the same way Jesus says, we need to be willing to forgive other people and give them a second chance. And in those moments when we encounter someone who we think doesn't deserve to be forgiven or who doesn't deserve to be given a second chance, we need to remember that we didn't either. And yet Jesus still did that for us. Do you know, Jesus doesn't forgive you and me based on who we are. He forgives you and me based on who he is. And that's what we need to remember. And that's the kind of love that we need to model. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He wrote and said about Jesus, he loves us not because we're lovable, but because he is love. The third thing I wrote down here about Jesus' love is his love expects the best for us. 
Because Jesus loves us, he wants and expects the best for us. We may have given up on ourselves a long time ago, and maybe that describes some of you this morning or some of you who are listening online. Maybe you have made so many mistakes that you've given up on yourself already. But when you meet Jesus and you experience the love of Jesus, you understand that he never gives up on you. Jesus never gives up on anyone. Someone say amen to that. And that's the way we're supposed to love each other. Love is not only the entry-level requirement for the Christian life, it is the foundation for everything God wants to see us become. And that's not ever going to change. In that same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the very first part of verse 8, Paul writes this about love. He says, love never fails. Love never fails. And so we keep on loving sacrificially. We keep on loving mercifully. And we keep on loving in a way that sees and expects the best for the people we encounter in our lives. Here's a third thing real quickly. Love is not invisible. It reveals who we are. Jesus said in verse 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, when I read about the early church and the kind of impact they had on the world, I get the overwhelming feeling that that impact was based primarily on the way they loved each other and the way they loved others. I got my Bible open. Don't turn there. I've got my Bible open to Acts chapter 2. When the very first church is described, you remember the first church happened or came together on the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches the first gospel sermon ever preached about Jesus and about 3,000 people responded to his message that day. About 3,000 people were baptized and that became the core of the very first church in Jerusalem. And this is how it's described beginning in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. Now listen to this phrase because it leapt off the page to me. And enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. So the first church was described as being a body of believers, a group of people that enjoyed the favor of all the people. I think that's got to be because of the way they loved. The way they loved sacrificially, the way they loved mercifully, and the way they loved and saw the best and expected the best in everyone. The reason why love has such a powerful impact on people is because love is not a feeling, it's an action. And this is the kind of love I really believe in my heart that has the power to change the world. And that brings us back to change for a dollar. Why do we do change for a dollar every week? Well, I, I hope that's a rhetorical question because you already know the answer. You saw the answer in the testimony of Brandon and Nisha. You saw the answer in this week's Change for a Dollar story and some of the things I shared earlier. But let me just break from the script for a minute and tell you why I really believe it's important to do Change for a Dollar. Uh, last Monday, we had our Monday morning recap meeting and our prayer time here in, in staff and we were talking about this weekend and talking about a variety of different things related to change for a dollar and I told the staff this story last December there was a family in our church who graciously opened up their home and invited our entire staff to their home for our annual Christmas party and they didn't just invite us to use their home they catered the whole thing at their own expense and we had a tremendous time together that day uh, because that's one of our favorite events of the year to have this all staff Christmas party and I got my phone out and I went around the house and I was taking pictures of different people as they were sitting at the tables and enjoying the meal and as they're playing games and just having fellowship together. And I posted several of those pictures on social media and, you know, I have a Pastor Philbeck Facebook page. I have an Instagram account and a Twitter account and all those things. And I posted some of them on my Twitter account. I went home that night and I was sitting on my sofa watching television and I pulled up my phone and I just scrolled through my Twitter account and I was shocked to see people who had posted on my Twitter account some of the meanest and the most hateful and the 
most crude, as far as language goes, things that I had ever read. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is happening right now? And I, I went through there, and listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you, friends, the, the, the language that, the, that was used, and I grew up in a family where cussing was an art form. Listen, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not naive about this kind of thing. And, and listen to me also, I am no, this might not surprise you, I am no stranger to criticism. I never read anything like this before in my life. People are writing things and calling me Satan and calling me the Antichrist and saying, I don't know who you are, but you're certainly not a Christian, and on and on and on. And those were the most kind things that I could tell you that were written. And I couldn't figure out for the life of me why in the world people that I had no idea who they were were all of a sudden lighting up my Twitter feed with these kinds of things. And so I started to research, and I realized when I walked into uh, the home that day, and I got there with my son and daughter who work on staff with me here a little bit early, uh, the host gave me a book because he had just had in his home a book release party uh, for a new book that was written about Vice President Mike Pence called The Faith of Mike Pence. This is the book right here, and he gave me a copy of it. He gave me a copy of it because on the inside, the author wrote a nice little note to me, and I was invited to the book release party, but I was out of town, and I could not go. Well, I took a picture uh, of the table I set out, and next to my place setting was this book face up so it could be seen. And as I got to reading through some of the responses, I realized that this is what was generating the hate. Because there were several uh, tweets in there that mentioned reference President Trump, and I never in my life write anything about President Trump, good, bad, or indifferent. But the hatred and the bitterness and the division in our country related to the current climate of politics and the characters was spewing out on my Twitter feed because of this. And so I just blocked and deleted all of those things, and I went back to my evening. I went to bed that night, and I plugged my phone in, but I took one look at my phone, and they were, there was a whole new set of all these things. And so they somehow gained traction in the social media word and I, world, and I blocked and I deleted all those, and I went to bed. I woke up the morning, and I, I, and I looked at my phone in the morning, and there was a whole new host of all of these things. Unbelievable. And so finally, I just deleted it all. This is the world we live in today. And there are a lot of angry, bitter, mean-spirited people because there are a lot of people who are a long way from God. And let me tell you something about people who are a long way from God for the most part. They will not be won by arguments. They'll be won by action. And in particular, it will be the action of love. Because just like you can't argue over the interpretation of what it means to love one another, you can't argue with somebody who's just trying to love you in a tangible way. And that's why we do change for a dollar. We don't qualify the recipients beyond their need. And this is why we need to continue to do change for a dollar. The other reason why we do change for, the dollar, is, for a dollar is this, and we'll close and the team will come and we're going to sing another song, we're going to watch a video, we're going to celebrate a baptism this morning, is because as we sat in that meeting last Monday and we talked about different change for dollar stories, here's the deal. Not all of the change for dollar stories have a happy ending. And some of them are sad and some of them are tragic. And they press people, even people of faith, to their extreme, to their absolute extreme when it comes to their understanding of God. And it creates questions about God. And it creates questions about the love and the grace and the mercy of God when you go through extreme suffering and extreme loss. But in those moments, don't you hope along with me that someone who is so lost in the moment, divided in their faith and understanding, don't you hope that they'll remember that in the darkest moment of their life, there were people that they didn't even know and probably would never even meet who came alongside of them and said, hey, we feel your pain and we want to help for no other reason than the love of Jesus compels us to love you. And that's why we do change for a dollar. 
And that's why we'll continue to do it. And we'll continue to serve our community in so many different ways that is sometimes really, really difficult behind the scenes. I know, I told my staff in that meeting, I know you get frustrated with me sometimes and you think, why are we doing this? This is so hard, this is so much extra work, but this is why we do what we do because you don't win people with arguments, you win them with actions, and in particular, it's the action of love because Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I want you to pray with me. Father in heaven, thanks so much for a chance to talk about this today. And thank you for change for a dollar. We pray your blessing on this ministry. And we pray that you would take it to even greater heights. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.